So um, my name is uh, Dr. Jen. Uh, I my first name is Wei Ying. I actually um, qualified uh, in England. Um, I did my medical school training in England, and then I moved back to my native home country of Singapore, um, where I did most of my um, postgraduate training. Uh, so I finished my hematology training in 2019. Um, and since then, um, I've been practicing in Singapore until I moved to the US to MD Anderson uh, to join the leukemia department um, uh, in June of this year. So um, Philadelphia chromosome positive ALL is a subtype of ALL. Um, in the past, uh, it was one of the more difficult um, ALLs to treat, um, and that was before the advent of tyrosine kinase inhibitors, TKIs. Um, these drugs were introduced in you know, the late 90s, early 2000s, and they really revolutionized the treatment of Philadelphia chromosome positive ALL because um, of the ability to target the Philadelphia chromosome. So the Philadelphia chromosome is a, is a chromosome that's formed because of an abnormal fusion between chromosomes 9 and 22. And what that results in is um, uh, turning on an oncogene, which essentially uh, uh, allows the cells to become, in a, in a, in a way, immortal and proliferate um, indefinitely. So the TKIs help us to target that. Um, and with more and more powerful TKIs, as they've been developed, um, we've been better and better at targeting Philadelphia positive ALL. It tends to affect um, the older population. So if you look at, um, you know, one of the interesting questions in ALL is why children with ALL comparatively do so much better than adults with Philadelphia with ALL. And uh, um, when you look at the, the types of mutations and, and chromosome abnormalities that um, uh, patients uh, have across the different age spectrum, um, Philadelphia positive ALL is much common in older adults. And it's, you know, it does happen, but it's relatively less common in, 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 in the kids in the pediatric population. So for Philadelphia positive ALL, um, in the past, it was a standard chemotherapy, and then you, everyone got a transplant if you were fit for a transplant. If you, and if you're not fit for a transplant, then it was, it was very difficult to manage because the disease would inevitably come back. Um, and then as, the, as times moved on, um, they started adding TKIs to the, the, the chemotherapy. And initially it was imatinib, then it became dasatinib when dasatinib was available, and now it's panatinib. Um, and more lately, uh, people have been trying to do chemotherapy-free approaches, so trying to treat Philadelphia-positive ALL um, without the use of chemotherapy, which is, you know, a novel uh, concept and very attractive because, you know, you don't get all the, the problems with chemotherapy, which are things like neutropenic fever, you know, the effects on the heart, cardiomyopathy, uh, the, the neuropathy that you can get with vincristine. So, so those, those papers were published in, 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 in the last, you know, few years or so, within the last five years. Um, and there have been combinations of uh, the immunotherapy agent blenatumumab, which targets CD19. Um, and the way it does it is it engages the body's T cells to fight C, um, uh, the cancer cells. Uh, so it's a bispecific T cell engager or a bite targeted at CD19 um, in combination with either panatinib or dasatinib. So those studies um, have been reported um, and the outcomes have looked pretty good. Um, now for us, the, the reason why we, we wanted to do this particular study where we combine chemotherapy, um, blenatumumab and panatinib was um, when we looked at the outcomes with blenatumumab and panatinib alone, there were two things that we noticed. Like number one, uh, patients who have progressed from CML, so they have uh, a lymphoid blast crisis of CML, um, or, or uh, uh, patients who might have a more CML-like biology, uh, may not do as well without chemotherapy. And secondly, um, uh, both in the studies which have used blenatumumab and dasatinib, and the one that you, the, our study, which uses blena and, and panatinib, we have seen um, some isolated relapses in the central nervous system, the CNS. Um, and so we, we, you know, we were a bit concerned that possibly, you know, we may need some chemotherapy in order to to target uh, um, uh, the CNS because a lot of these agents, you know, don't cross into the CNS. That's both a good and a bad thing. Um, and so that's where the rationale for the, designing this combination came in. 
so this study is actually, it was designed to, to look at the feasibility of combining chemotherapy, blinitumab, and a TKI um, in, in patients. So it's not a large study. Um, it's more to see what the response rates were and, and you know, um, and then we can expand it thereafter. Um, but the goal of this study was to see how, was to see whether or not we could combine these drugs and how effective they would be in patients with Philadelphia positive ALL. Now we looked at patients who are newly diagnosed patients with relapse refractory disease. And we also looked at patients um, with CML and lymphoid blast crisis. So, so there were three groups that were studied. Um, and we also, um, uh, because of because the, 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 the patient population was rather heterogeneous, there was you know three different types of people being enrolled, the primary outcome measure was slightly different for both enrollment cohorts. So for the newly diagnosed patients, we wanted to look at the rate of complete molecular response. So that's where you, you can't detect the BCR able by quantitative PCR. Um, and for the newly uh, for the relapse refractory and the CML patients, uh, we wanted to look at the, the, the response rate. Um, and so that's that's how we designed the study. In terms of the actual treatment that's administered, um, we start off with chemotherapy. So this is uh, low intensity chemotherapy, which is attractive because you know uh, we are hoping that um, we can omit the toxic effects of chemotherapy by lowering the intensity while still preserving the efficacy. So patients on this trial get four cycles of chemotherapy, um, and that's what we call mini CBD. Uh, so in the odd numbered cycles, they get cyclophosphamide, vincristine, and dexamethasone. And the even-numbered cycles, they get methotrexate and cytarabine. So they get that for four cycles. And then they go on to blinatumumab consolidation, um, and they get that for four cycles. So we give the blinatumumab for four weeks with a two-week break. And then after that, they go on to maintenance. So in the maintenance, they get uh, 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 very uh, small amounts of chemotherapy, vincristine and prednisolone. Um, and these are 28-week uh, cycles. They get that for three cycles, and then they get a blenitumumab. And then they get the three cycles of chemotherapy, and they get a blenitumumab. And this whole thing repeats four times. And throughout all of that, the patients are on um, a TKI called panatinib. Uh, the panatinib initially starts at 30 milligrams a day. Um, and, you know, for the people watching this, you may you may ask why 30 milligrams a day, because the approved dose is 45 milligrams a day. Um, and so it's actually to, to mitigate toxicity. We found, you know, in our experience with panatinib, when we, we first started using it with hypersevad, we initially started with 45 milligrams um, a day. Um, and there were actually, uh, initially, we did see two deaths which were related to thrombotic events. Um, and this is not in this study, but in a separate study when we first started using panatinib. So in that study, there was a protocol amendment to, to reduce the dose of panatinib more quickly to 30 milligrams. And um, also outside of ALL, um, uh, uh, Dr. Jorge Cortez has also published in CML um, to show that lowering doses of panatinib once responses have ach are, are achieved um, can give very good outcomes. So for this study, we start panatinib at 30 milligrams a day. And then we go down to 15 milligrams a day uh, once uh, CMR, complete, metabolic, um, complete uh, molecular response, has been achieved. In, in this study, actually, the findings were very encouraging. So um, uh, in all our patients were evaluable for a response. We saw a 100% response rate. So every single patient who was treated actually did respond. Um, and, and this is, this is uh, something that we're very encouraged by. Um, and in terms of uh, the complete molecular response, um, uh, for our newly diagnosed patients, uh, almost 80% achieved a, uh, a CMR, which means that almost 80% of patients were able to completely clear out uh, the BCR mut able mutation. And this is uh, um, something that was achieved relatively quickly. Um, the median time to this kind of response was about 2.1 months, um, which is which is quick for, for, for patients. Um, and uh, even in our relapse refractory and, and CML with lymphoid blast phase patients, uh, we did see uh, um, everyone responding. Um, and uh, um, the CMR rates for those patients were uh, a bit more difficult to interpret because some of them had relapses um, uh, not within the bone marrow. And But the, the, for the people who we were, we were able to measure it, the, the CMR rate for these people uh, were about two thirds. I mean, if you ask me 
how would this um, inform my practice? I think two things to highlight. Number one, um, these patients were young, right? So, so we're using low intensity chemotherapy in young patients. We're getting good results. Um, obviously, we're planning to expand this trial to enroll more patients because, um, you know, the numbers are small. That's the main limitation of this study, right? Um, and we don't want to draw uh, conclusions too quickly based on a small study. But um, I think what's encouraging um, and, and what I would highlight from this study is that um, so far, uh, out of the 20 patients we've treated, there's only been one um, isolated CNS relapse, and that patient was actually not taking the medication. So um, uh, we might have been able to better address the CNS relapses in this study. So, so what are the adv advantages? Number one, um, it's low intensity chemotherapy. So um, our early 60 day mortality rate with this study was actually zero. There were, there were no early mortalities. Um, number two, we get to add blenitumumab, which um, earlier studies have demonstrated is effective in, in Philadelphia positive ALL. Um, and number three, uh, um, the CNS uh, relapse rate has been encouraging. How would it inform my practice? I think we need to expand this study to, to confirm that the effect that we're seeing is, is persistent in, in, a, in a larger population of patients. I think for Philadelphia positive ALL, um, one of the big uh, um, move forward is that now, you know, you may, not, you may be able to treat patients without requiring a transplant. Um, and we see that increasingly in patients who are treated with frontline penetinib because of the depth and speed of response. Um, and, you know, if you've ever met anyone who's had a transplant or, or had GVHD, then you know that that is something that, you know, insofar as possible, we want to avoid. So, so for me, um, would I use penatinib frontline for my patients with Philadelphia positive ALL? Absolutely. Um, would I try, would I offer a chemotherapy free approach, an intensive chemotherapy approach or a hybrid approach like this? I think it depends on the patient factors that you're looking at. Um, but if I was worried about um, the CNS relapse risk in particular, you know, if I thought a patient needed some chemotherapy, then yes, I, I think I would choose something like this, um, a hybrid type regimen over something that was just pure chemotherapy um, or pure immunotherapy alone. I, I would uh, caution still um, in terms of um, using regimens like this. I think um, physician awareness uh, into the toxicities um, of the newer agents is something that you know we need to to to, um, to to talk about and to make sure that people are aware of. So penatinib in particular is a very toxic drug if you don't use it properly. So uh, what I talked about earlier about you know uh, mitigating strategies in terms of starting at a low dose, reducing a dose to 15 milligrams very quickly once you have a good response, those are critical. Um, and also, before you uh, start a patient on penetinib, you know, um, making sure that the patient's cardiovascular risk factors are controlled. Um, uncontrolled cardiovascular risk factors were an exclusion criteria on this study. Um, and, you know, you don't want to um, start penetinib on someone who's got, for example, uncontrolled um, uh, ischemic heart disease, right? Because then you could precipitate an MI with, with the side effect of the drug. So, those are important considerations. Other things to look out for include things like pancreatitis, which we do see from time to time. And um, uh, for, for patients with indwelling central venous catheters, um, remembering that the, the risk of thrombosis also applies to venous thrombosis. Um, um, so that's something to watch out for. Then, of course, with blenitumumab, it's the neurotoxicity and the, the, the cytokine release that can be prohibitive um, and monitoring very closely for those interrupting the drug early, um, you know, uh, giving corticosteroids um, as well as dose reductions um, and managing these doses and dose escalations when to stop, when to restart is something that's always very important in, in, in using blenitumumab safely. So, you know, I would encourage that if there's any concern at all, you know, to get in touch um, uh, with a local tertiary center or a physician or any any time who can always give some advice on, on uh, uh, managing these newer combinations and the unique toxicities of these newer drugs.